This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Good morning and welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond once again at the premier broadcast time of 10am on a Saturday morning. Before the football. Yes, as Alex always says, before the football and of course, indeed before all other really much more useful things you can get up to on a Saturday morning. Now I'll let Alex tell you what we have in store for you today. Well this week on the spectacularly well chosen day of April the 1st, Humza Yusuf as First Minister chose to, to implement an act, the Hate Crime Act, a controversial piece of social legislation, no doubt with the best of intentions, but legislation which has disaster written all over it. Now in the name of protecting minorities from malicious abuse, particularly over the internet, the fears are that the Scottish Parliament have created a mad haters charter, by which politically correct chancers will seek to silence their political opponents. And this is a disaster with a difference on other pieces of controversial legislation, whether it be fishing bans or bottle schemes or, or of course, self-identification. Hamza Yusuf could say he inherited it from his predecessor, Nicholas Sturgeon. But in this Hate Crime Act, he was the Justice Minister when it passed through Parliament in 2021. So in hate crime, there is going to be no hiding place for Hamza Yusuf if it turns into a disaster. Now, no one doubts the Act's good intentions, but that is what paves the road to hell. And when this little fellow made an appearance last week, the critics had a field day. You might know this thing here. It's the hate monster. When you're feeling insecure, when you feel angry, he'll be there, feeding off the emotions. Getting bigger and bigger till he's weighing you down. He'll make you want to have a go at somebody. A neighbour, somebody on the street, on a night out. Security guy on the door, somebody in the chippy, your taxi driver. He'll make you want to vent your anger, just because folk look or act different for you. The hate monster wants you to feel what you need to show. You're better than them. Then, before you know it, you've committed a hate crime. The lead demonstrator this week was author J.K. Rowling, who challenged Police Scotland to arrest her when she returns to Edinburgh. Now, before you could say, Expaliarmus, Police Scotland back down. And this is what our Alex has to say about it. On to uh, Mr. Salmon, and uh, you've got uh, the hate monster. Tell us why you Well, hate this is the, the winner. Monster. I mean, it has to be the winner. The hate monster. It's looking is, good, I'll tell is you that. A, wee, a wee thing that looks like an Easter egg. But when the hate monster detects hate, I mean, for example, if we had a wee hate monster looking like an Easter egg on that table, after a session of this, it would be huge. Because this is about the hate crime bill in Scotland. And Police Scotland devised the hate monster. And then they have a, a, a video which, you know, is like Watch With Mother. You know, they're like, they're talking, play that in a minute, but they're talking to two-year-olds and they say, if you're bad, or you hate the hate monster will feed and grow and grow and grow. But if we're all nice to each other, Alec, the hate monster will shrink down to virtually nothing. Now, the hate monster, unfortunately, just made its debut last week. Uh, and now it's been relegated online. Now, does that... So oh, a hey, bell with is this for kids, Alex? Is that for for adults? <laughs> no, no, but see, the, the, key, the key target <clears throat> for the, uh, looking at hate crime is young men. Uh, between the ages of around 14 to 20. Uh, unfortunately, Police Scotland thought it was 14 months to 20 months and, and devised their Watch With Mother video 
uh, accordingly. So I think it's all been a mistake. And so for today's big interview, I, I turned to one of the Act's leading critics, the Arapa parliamentary leader at Westminster, Neil Hanvey, Member of Parliament. Now, Neil Hanvey, you've been a vociferous opponent of the Hate Crime Act, as it is now. I mean, five days or so into implementation, aren't the fears that have been expressed a bit, a bit exaggerated, basically? Well, I don't think the, the concerns about the Act are exaggerated because uh, there are fundamental flaws in the way that the legislation's been drafted. It's imprecise. Uh, which is a real problem. It lacks clarity about um, definitions uh, of various uh, instruments within it. Uh, and more importantly, it's not just about what's in the Act, it's about what's not in the Act and who's not protected uh, by the Act, and most importantly, women uh, uh, who have been subjected to some absolutely horrendous uh, uh, abuse, both online and uh, uh, as they just try to go about their normal daily lives. But the Scottish Government say there's going to be a misogyny bill coming forward. I mean, aren't they, going to, aren't they going to make up for that at some point in the future? Well, I mean, one would hope that, that it will be a, a clear, precise piece of legislation uh, based on the Hate Crime Act. Um, that, that doesn't bode particularly well. But the real concern that I have uh, about not just this legislation or the Misogyny Act uh, but the GRR bill uh, and the proposed the gender, recognition. The gender recognition reform bill, uh, which failed, uh, but also the um, uh, conversion practices proposals. All of these uh, pieces of legislation are framed uh, within the, the broad kind of scope of queer theory or gender ideology. Uh, and my concern about uh, legislation against misogyny is that that will include trans-identifying males. So men who uh, either uh, want to live as women or who have a gender recognition certificate to say that they are legally female. But there's a lot more in the Hate Crime Act than, uh, than transgender respect, respect for transgender people. I mean, there's a whole range of characteristics that are protected now, I mean, including age, for example. I mean, aren't there fundamentally good intentions in this bill? This is about people not behaving badly towards each other. Yeah, I, I mean, our, our position within the Alpha Party was set out in a, a, a motion that I brought forward that, that recognises and acknowledges that the... Um, hate in any shape or form uh, should not be tolerated in any liberal democracy. That just should be an absolute given. Um, but the problem with this legislation is twofold. First of all, all of the reasons that I gave about its imprecision and lack of clarity around the definitions. Uh, it, but there's also um, uh, concerns around the behaviour that we've seen exhibited over the last five or so years where um, uh, queer theory activists have deliberately targeted women for trying to uh, uphold their sex-based rights. And because those rights are not included in the Act, they are fair game, still fair game, for those queer theory extremists to go after women, to harass them, to push them out of their jobs and to make their lives an absolute misery. So, yes, but this I, Act is not going to be implemented by groups of activists. It's going to be administered by the police. It's going to be uh, go through the, the courts when uh, somebody is found to have transgressed. I mean, surely these institutions are, are, are not going to be behaving in a, an irresponsible or, or reckless way. Well, I mean, the, the Act passed in 2021. There has been now three years to prepare the police uh, in how they interpret uh, and uh, manage the introduction of this legislation. But we also know that the police's training has, has uh, uh, amounted to two hours of online training to deal with what are very subtle and uh, complex issues. And it just seems uh, uh, ludicrous that given all of that time, all of the concerns over the imprecision within the legislation, that a sum total of two hours of training has been, a ma has been made available to the officers uh, uh, who will be tasked with implementing this law. But the, the Minister Siobhan Brown, the Communities Minister, she stressed that this is about how a reasonable person would interpret behaviour. It's not going to be interpreted in an unreasonable fashion. 
Well, I, I think Siobhan Brown undermined her own credibility in her interview with Justin Webb earlier this week. Uh, she uh, asserted that the uh, bill passed unanimously. It did not, so completely undermining her credibility. Uh, and um, the, the sense that um, any reasonable person would interpret the legislation in a fair and balanced way is undermined by the Scottish Government's own behaviour over the last five years, where they have not behaved reasonably, proportionately, or indeed respectfully to anyone who has a view that does not align with their own. So whether or not this legislation is going to cause the chaos that, uh, that many people fear, or whether it will end up as a storm in a teacup, there is a, a, a certain puzzlement, isn't there, that the Scottish Government should be investing so much credibility in issues like self-identification, issues like the, the Hate Crime Act. I mean, they're not leaving much bandwidth for pursuing the cause of Scottish independence. Well, I, if you could look at the, uh, the, the situation in Grangemouth, for example, which Kenny McCaskill has been championing the, uh, the campaign to save, um, if they had invested even a quarter of the effort that they put into these niche policies, into a campaign to get funding to save Grangemouth, then that would have saved thousands of jobs, protected uh, um, oil uh, security for Scotland, uh, and uh, would have boosted the Scottish economy. But, but they're away off in some parallel universe. Is your thinking that uh, the, the bill has many dangers and we're going to see examples of, of people being treated unreasonably? Or is your concern more that the, the police resources are going to be hopelessly tied up with pursuing things? The vast majority of things go nowhere, yeah. but nonetheless it's going to expend police time, resources. Well, they don't have time to investigate whether somebody's burgled your house. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen... Uh, uh, those announcements from Police Scotland recently that they're not going to be able to investigate every perceived crime, but they're devoting a huge amount of resource uh, for this particular issue. And I meet with local uh, senior police officers and I know how stretched the force is. So for them to be burdened uh, by uh, this type of reporting, and we know it's real because Murdo Fraser, the uh, MS, Conservative MSP, has already discovered that a non-crime hate incident has been recorded against his name for a tweet. And now, Neil Handley, can I bring you on to my favourite subject? And that is the, the hate monster. <laughs> this, uh, I mean, I, I've been obsessed by this uh, strange uh, orange image uh, over, the, uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, there is a certain amount of humour in this. But does the fact that the campaign is being pursued in such an honest, childish way give you real cause for concern? Uh, well, it, it makes us look rather foolish, I think, as a, as a country and, uh, and our parliament look rather childish. And it really underscores many of the points that I've made about that lack of broad scanning, of understanding the, the, the real issues at play and reducing it down to some cartoon character that somehow Scotland is uh, infested with hate monsters running around the country spreading hate. It's, it's ludicrous and, and, and sadly not very laughable. And of course, uh, one thing Scotland has at the present moment is plenty of people demonstrating. Uh, what do you think of the, the uh, demonstrations we've seen this week already? I mean, people really concerned uh, uh, and uptight about this legislation? Well, I've joined um, uh, women, men, uh, gay, straight, feminists, non-feminists outside the Scottish Parliament several times and I've campaigned alongside them uh, in their efforts to highlight all of these, uh, this queer theory slate of legislation and its potential impact uh, on uh, the wider equalities uh, agenda. And, you know, and I wish them all the, the very best um, and it's great to see that the people's voice is still being spoken loudly and clearly outside the Scottish Parliament. And lastly, Neil Harvey, you personally won't be doing anything to, to feed that hate monster, will you? I, I certainly won't. I mean, I, I don't hate anyone. Um, what I am frustrated by is the lack of uh, um, critical thinking that's been brought to bear 
on a hugely important issue uh, where equalities really matters, where real hate crime should be pursued, but it has to be done uh, within uh, a context that is understood, clearly described, and use the, with the use of precise legislation that everyone understands. Neil Handley, thank you so much for joining me on Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Thanks, Alec. But the Hate Crime Act hasn't been uh, just keeping the police and demonstrators busy this week. Uh, one of our, our best-known bloggers uh, has been uh, oiling the, the wheels of the legal profession to, to find out if his blog is, is safe from encroachment by this act. Reverend Stuart Campbell, Wings Over Scotland, tell us now, is Wings safe for the nation from the Hate Crime Act? Well, I mean, it, it's, it looks sort of like we are. The, the legal opinion was actually quite qualified. It said, we said that technically this, the Act gives the Scottish Government jurisdiction not just over England, but the entire planet. But um, interestingly, I just listened to the Siobhan Brown, the Scottish Government Minister on the Today programme a little while ago, and she told Justin Webb very unambiguously that, that it was only to be applied to people who lived in Scotland. So that would appear to be some kind of personal guarantee from the minister. Well, of course, uh, it does have, uh, uh, I was going to say, extraterrestrial functions to it, but I suppose it's extraterritorial functionality, certainly in the Act itself. Uh, and I do remember another piece of legislation, the, the Behaviour at Football Matches Bill, which you and I both, uh, well, I enacted and you supported, that was actually applied uh, in England uh, during a match with Rangers Football Club and Berwick Rangers. So perhaps Siobhan Brown has learned lessons from the mistakes of the past. Perhaps so, yeah. Although, of course, there is also always that long-standing question of whether which country Eric is really in, but we probably shouldn't get into that right now. But I mean, seriously, for you, I mean, you, you sought an opinion uh, from top notch lawyers, uh, uh, Roddy Dunlop, the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, and I've read your opinion, and generally speaking, it seems to be quite reassuring uh, and answers some of the, uh, the, the more, uh, more challenging worries that this, uh, this act has stimulated. Yeah, I mean, lawyers will never give you a sort of 100% guarantee, cast iron, copper bottom sort of guarantee about anything. But yeah, it seemed to be a, a pretty comprehensive view that none of the sort of things that Wing says would, to any reasonable person, constitute a crime. And a reasonable person is supposed to be the, the benchmark set out in the law. And some of your stuff uh, is pretty fruity, uh, Stuart, would you not say? I mean, it's, I'm not for a second uh, accusing you of feeding the hate monster, but, uh, but some of your stuff is pretty strongly expressed. I mean, you're, you're not known for pulling your punches. Well, no, I mean, we, we, we get in fights, but the, but the, um, the ECHR, the, the European Convention of Human Rights, Article 10, does very expressly protect the right to, to speak 
insultingly to use strong words to to offend people where where need be. And you know these are these are very sensitive people. I I've already seen on social media this morning a number of people who have who are saying that they've got the police coming to see them tomorrow about terrible terrible things that myself and Graham Linehan I think have done. So the, yeah, these people are very easily upset, but there there does seem to be strong protection from, if not in the hate crime act, then in the, the European Convention for Human Rights that does protect you from for, for being a part of these very sensitive people's feelings. But Stuart Campbell, I mean, it's some the use of his first minister going to be protected uh, with the retrospective aspects, because some people have said that some of his comments and the the Scottish Parliament might uh, fall foul of his own legislation. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, I, I've already heard that, um, that I've, from a very reliable police source that a considerable number of complaints have been filed about his speech in, I believe it was June 2020, where he expressed his grave displeasure about how many people in Scotland were white. Uh, the, the legal opinion that we've had says that in normal circumstances, it would not be that the law wouldn't apply retroactively, but it's not impossible for it to do so, and there is precedent by which it has done so. So I, I don't think he's completely in the clear, but he'll probably be all right. What if you agree with me on two things, uh, Stuart Campbell? I, I, you see, I think that people should be entitled to say things I disagree with, uh, and Hubs is entitled to make his remarks about uh, the racial imbalance of key positions in Scottish society, in my opinion. Uh, but I'm wondering about two aspects of this. Firstly, there seems to be a fundamental lack of confidence in the, the authorities, the legal authorities, the Scottish government's ability uh, to implement legislation in a proportionate and reasonable manner. Uh, is that the, a key concern? I mean, absolutely. I mean, the Scottish government has an abysmal track record of, of producing competent legislation. And the very fact that it's taken three years for Police Scotland to feel that they were ready to implement this act since it's been passed suggests, I think, that it is very poorly drafted legislation, very poorly understood by the people who are are charged with, with upholding it. I mean, we, we again, Siobhan Brown, the minister on today this morning, didn't seem to have any clue what might or might not constitute a crime and said, oh, it's entirely up to the police to, to interpret this. But, I mean, that's, that suggests that the police are effectively making the law. And isn't it a police state when the police decide what the law is? Uh, and secondly, my, my other concern, uh, see if you agree with this, because I know you've had experience of it. It's not so much that we're going to get any prosecutions unreasonably out of this legislation, but the entity who is accused of it and investigated is going to end up uh, having their life turned upside down, sometimes for motivations in the part of the complainers which won't be entirely honourable. How do you feel about that criticism of this act? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you and I both know firsthand what that's like and how, how difficult that can be. And uh, there, there's certainly no shortage of malice going around Scotland at the moment. So I think I don't think the safeguards on this are anywhere near strong enough. I think it, it only really takes, you know, one rainbow badge police officer to go, oh, you know what, I think I am going to go and arrest this guy just to see what happens. And also, I, what, something that my solicitor said to me recently is that the way you establish where the, the boundaries are with a law like this, when especially when it's so, you know, it's so unclear, is that you have cases, is that you go and you arrest people and you charge them and you and you run it through court just to find out where the lines are, sort of thing. And that's a quite a quite a scary prospect as well. The fact that the idea of somebody just being used as a as a guinea pig. I mean for you, again you and I relatively used to a bit of rough and tumble in the in the world of politics. But for but for normal folk the idea of having the police come to their door and haul them off in a car and stick them in a cell and interview them under caution, it's absolutely terrifying. Well, Stuart Campbell, since the, the hate monster was addressed and pretendy Scots, uh, let me give you some real Scots to close. The Reverend Stuart Campbell, Wings Over Scotland, Lang May Your Lum Reek. Thanks a lot. Welcome back. 
Now last week's show featured seasoned independence campaigner Jim Sillers, who was less than forgiving about the standard of today's Hollywood politicians. Never wisely ignored, this is what Jim had to say. I have moments of utter despair at the moment. Someone asked me about, so about a year ago, how are you feeling? And I said, well, I've a split personality, to which he said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I said, look, on, on the family side, you know, I've got grandchildren I see regularly and my stepdaughters and my daughter look after me. On that side, I'm very happy. I said, on the public side, I'm in utter despair. Now, it's not I'm in utter despair that we will never make that 55%. It's the damage that's being done to the independence idea by what the present Scottish Green government is doing to the Scottish economy and Scottish society. I think it's doing enormous damage to the idea of independence. And in fact, the remarkable feature is, despite them, we're at 50% in the poll. <laughs> and therefore, the, you know, if we can get changes to the national movement's leadership and get a national organisation together, then I think independence can come much quicker than many people realise. And this is what you had to say on our show last week. Jim Spence says, two men for independence with a combined intellectual capacity equal to that of the entire SNP cohort at Holyrood. Keita says, brilliant conversation with Jim Sill is really interesting. Ian Conicky says, fantastic interview with Jim Sellers. All indie supporters need to hear this, if only for the 50 years of experience the man has. Fergie says, this is a really good pan out to the history of devolution this week. Even for us not so young viewers, it's nice to have a reminder of the hope we had and path we thought we were on, even until a few years ago. Can Scotland ever recapture that hope? And finally, Jerry says, Jim and Alex are political heavyweights. I wish I could see worthy successes emerging from the current generation, but I can't. Please do keep your comments coming in. Now to Alex's favourite part of the show, Scotland's Hidden Heroes, sponsored by Flagship Media. Gwendolyn Emily Meacham, better known as Wendy Wood, Scottish nationalist, was a woman after my own heart. For many years, perhaps for more than half a century, this doughty campaigner was the foremost figure in the Scottish independence movement. Born in 1890 in Kent in England, uh, Wendy Wood's heart was in the Highlands and heart was most certainly in Scotland. Uh, and she campaigned as a, a doughty fighter for many, many years. <laughs> Wendy Wood was seizing the Union flag and taking it down from Stirling Castle battlements in the 1930s. And her campaigns as leader of the, the Scottish Patriots uh, were a challenge to the orthodoxy of the, the young Scottish National Party at the time, but also in many of her campaigns of direct action, she inspired the people of Scotland to believe that someone was leading the campaign, and that someone was Wendy Wood. One of my father's favourite stories was that uh, in the post-war uh, period, uh, he went down to Wembley with some of his pals in the carefree days before I was born. Uh, and uh, they uh, delighted in defending Wendy, who was making a vigorous speech denouncing the English in all parts of her own country uh, in Trafalgar Square when a group of uh, London bobbies moved menacingly towards us. According to my dad's story, the Scotland fans, led by him and his chums, uh, had a phalanx uh, to protect Wendy and escort her safely from the scene unarrested. Now, I don't know how much of that uh, is true, but I can well believe it of my dad, and I can certainly believe it of Wendy Wood. Wendy Wood had one other attribute. Well, she had a fantastic uh, career as an artist, uh, and although I never had the privilege of meeting Wendy, who died in the early 1980s at the age of 90, uh, I, I do have one of her watercolours, and she was a talented uh, artist, and she wrote books about the Highlands and other things, as well as being a great campaigner. But she knew one secret thing about the art of political campaigning. Although Wendy was an ardent Scottish nationalist, she didn't lounge the imperial power for all its bad works across the world. Uh, and she was vehement, both in her denunciation of uh, Westminster and London and her advocacy of a, an independent Scotland. 
But Wendy Wood also knew that the art of political campaigning was not just to campaign for the high ideal, but the things that mattered immediately to people. And she was a foremost campaigner for an escalator up the Waverley Steps. And many people who wouldn't dream of ever associating themselves with the Scottish Nationalist cause used to write letters to, to the Scotsman saying that Wendy Wood may be wrong on Scottish independence, but she's certainly right in getting an escalator up the Waverley Steps, which were a burden to anybody over the age of about 30. And now, of course, thankfully, there is an escalator, and sometimes that escalator even works. So next time you're at Waverley Station, and you take the escalator up to Princess Street, then spare a thought for a, a doughty campaigner, a fighter for Scottish nationalism, Wendy Wood, born in England, but no more patriotic Scot has there ever been. And she is a, a worthy entrant to our pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes. Water is life, but not all water is equal. Our water ionizer restructures and alkalizes water for optimum hydration and detoxification. Recreating the planet's ultimate water sources, found in lightning struck lakes and newly melted icebergs. H2 Pure Source. Change your water. Change your life. So what's behind uh, this week's stooshy on the, the hate crime bill? Is it all a storm in a teacup or are we actually seeing a, a fundamental challenge to civil liberties? Well, I suppose I think it's a bit of both. It is a storm in a teacup to some extent. And that is because I think it's unlikely that we're going to get a flood of prosecutions of people abusing each other over the internet. I don't think that's going to happen. But on the other hand, there are aspects of this legislation which people are quite right to be very excited about and very concerned about. And that is, of course, that the legislation exemplifies uh, the fact that the Scottish Government in recent years has started to pursuing a, a social agenda which is at variance with the, the views of a significant part, if not an overwhelming majority, of the population. Now, some people look at the, the Scottish Government at the present moment, look at the economic challenges facing the country, look at the rather dismal prospect of Scotland moving forward with challenging aspects on both the economy and on population and say, well, with the resources we have, we should be piloting forward to a new future. 
Some people might say, looking at uh, Neil Hanvey, said Grangemouth Refinery, this should be the focal point of the Scottish Government's campaign to say this far and no further, we're going to claim back our own resources. And therefore they would add, why on earth is the same Scottish Government spending its time, its bandwidth, its political credibility on issues such as self-identification, on bottle schemes, on fishing bans, and now on this hate crime bill? And it's a very difficult question to answer because this is not the most perfect piece of legislation that's ever been delivered through a parliament. On the contrary, it's full of vagueness, it's full of imprecision, it's full of the things that excite people's fears that a piece of legislation is going to be used for malevolent purposes. Of course it's true, as I've just said, I don't think lots of folk are going to end up in soft in prison because of the Hate Crime Act. Uh, but I think it's also true that many people are going to be concerned and also think it's an invitation, almost an open invitation uh, for people to complain about folk they don't like. And when the Police Scotland say things like they're going to investigate every hate crime complaint, but of course they, they may not have the time or the trouble to investigate a burglary if they don't think they're going to catch the villains, then of course it excites public concern. And public concern about the justice system is one of the most fundamental things in any society because if people start to think that the justice system of Scotland is not fair and square, that it's not being applied properly and equally uh, across the population, that it is being and somehow manoeuvred by to political advantage, losing confidence in the justice system is a desperate loss of confidence in society itself. So the Scottish Government are not perhaps wrong in a, an ambition to, to make people like each other more, to make people behave better. And that is something we all would ardently wish for. The mistake is much more in believing that that is a key just in terms of legislation, as opposed to the educational process, the inspiration of society, the, the collective wisdom of looking into the, the Scottish ethos uh, and finding the things that we should all try to emulate. That's how you make people behave better. Uh, I saw a comment from a, a supporter of the hate crime bill saying, look, there is hate in society, therefore we need legislation to end it. And in that comment, of course, there's a fundamental misunderstanding about society and about how you achieve such a worthwhile objective. The way you end hate is not by legislation or on pieces of paper. The way you end hate is by instilling in the hearts of women and men a vision of a better society, that we can people to sign up for the idea that we are going to create a, a very special country here in Scotland and that we can do it by working together with that common objective. You inspire people to think of a better future. That's the way you end hate in the hearts of people, not by putting forward a, a piece of legislation vastly imperfect, but even if it were perfect, would not achieve the objective. So let's concentrate in Scotland on the things that matter, on the development of our country into the future and not get hijacked and led down highways and byways eh, by politicians who no doubt have fantastic good intentions but also are imperfect like the rest of us in how they implement them. Now this week there can be only one way to close our show on the Hate Crime Act and that is to assure viewers that there have been no transgressions on our part. So take it away, hate monster. You see, if you're not careful, the hate monster's coming to get you. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it'll swallow you all up. But after watching our show, the hate monster's getting smaller and smaller till it's fading away to nothing at all. And that's how it should be in the new Scotland. This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward.
This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond.